Before you start listening, it might interest you to take a look at the description of this video. It includes some extra information about what you're listening to, ATLDR if you don't have time to listen to the whole thing and some other information about the passage from Outliers. One warm spring day in May of 2007, the Medicine Hat Tigers and the Vancouver Giants met for the Memorial Cup Hockey Championships in Vancouver, British Columbia. The Tigers and the Giants were the two finest teams in the Canadian Hockey League, which in turn is the finest junior hockey league in the world. These were the future stars of the sport. 17, 18, and 19-year-olds who had been skating and shooting pucks since they were barely more than toddlers. The game was broadcast on Canadian national television. Up and down the streets of downtown Vancouver, Memorial Cup banners hung from the lampposts. The arena was sold out. A long red carpet was rolled out on the ice, and the announcer introduced the game's dignitaries. First came the Premier of British Columbia, Gordon Campbell, then, amid tumultuous applause, out walked Gordy Howe, one of the legends of the game. Ladies and gentlemen, the announcer boomed, Mr. Hockey. For the next 60 minutes, the two teams played spirited, aggressive hockey. Vancouver scored first early in the second period on a rebound by Mario Blizneck. Late in the second period, it was Medicine Hat's turn, as the team's scoring leader, Darren Helm, fired a quick shot past Vancouver's goalie, Tyson Sexsmith. Vancouver answered in the third quarter, scoring the game's deciding goal, and then, when Medicine Hat pulled its goalie in desperation, Vancouver scored a third time. In the aftermath of the game, the players and their families and sports reporters from across the country crammed into the winning team's locker room. The air was filled with cigar smoke and the smell of champagne and sweat-soaked hockey gear. On the wall was a hand-painted banner, Embrace the Struggle. In the center of the room, the Giants coach, Don Hay, stood misty-eyed. I'm just so proud of these guys, he said. Just look around the locker room. There isn't one guy who didn't buy in wholeheartedly. Canadian hockey is a meritocracy. Thousands of Canadian boys begin to play the sport at the novice level before they are even in kindergarten. From that point on, there are leagues for every age class, and at each of those levels, the players are sifted and sorted and evaluated, with the most talented separated out and groomed for the next level. By the time players reach their mid-teens, the very best of the best have been channeled into an elite league known as Major Junior A, which is the top of the pyramid. And if your major junior A team plays for the Memorial Cup, that means you're at the very top of the very top of the pyramid. This is the way most sports pick their future stars. It's the way soccer is organized in Europe and South America, and the way Olympic athletes are chosen. For that matter, it's not all that different from the way the world of classical music picks its future virtuosos, and the way the world of ballet picks its future ballerinas, and the way that our elite educational system picks its future scientists and intellectuals. You can't buy your way into major junior A hockey. It doesn't matter who your father or mother is, or who your grandfather was, or what business your family is in. Nor does it matter if you live in the most remote corner of the most northerly province in Canada. If you have ability, the vast network of hockey scouts and talent spotters will find you. And if you are willing to work to develop that ability, the system will reward you. Success in hockey is based on individual merit, and both of those words are important. Players are judged on their own performance, not anyone else's, and on the basis of ability, not some other arbitrary fact. Or are they? If you were to look at the player roster of the 2007 Medicine Hat Tigers, you might see something strange about it. But even if you didn't, you shouldn't feel bad, because for many years in the hockey world, no one did. It wasn't until the mid-1980s, in fact, that a Canadian psychologist named Roger Barnsley first drew attention to the phenomenon of relative age. Barnsley was at a Lethbridge Broncos hockey game in southern Alberta, a team that played in the same major junior A league as the Vancouver Giants and the Medicine Hat Tigers. He was there with his wife, Paula, and their two boys, 
and his wife was reading the program when she ran across the roster list. Roger, she said, do you know when these young men were born? Barnsley said, yes. They're all between 16 and 20, so they'd be born in the late 1960s. No, no, Paula went on. What month? I thought she was crazy, Barnsley remembered. But I looked through it, and what she was saying just jumped out at me. For some reason, there were an incredible number of January, February, and March birth dates. Barnsley went home that night and looked at the birth dates of as many professional hockey players as he could find. He saw the same pattern. Barnsley, his wife, and a colleague, A. H. Thompson, then gathered statistics on every player in the Ontario Junior Hockey League. The story was the same. More players are born in January than in any other month, and by an overwhelming margin. The second most frequent birth month? February. The third? March. Barnsley found that there were nearly five and a half times as many Ontario Hockey League players born in January as were born at the end of the year in November. He looked at the all-star teams of 11-year-olds and 13-year-olds, the young players selected for elite traveling squads. Same story. He looked at the composition of the National Hockey League. Same story. The more he looked, the more Barnsley came to believe that what he was seeing was not a chance occurrence, but an iron law of Canadian hockey. That any time you look at an elite group of hockey players, the very best of the best, you can reliably assume that 40% of the players will be born between January and March, 30% between April and June, 20% between July and September, and 10% between October and December. In all my years in psychology, I have never run into an effect this large, Barnsley says. You don't even need to do any statistical analysis. You just look at it. What would you have seen if you'd looked at that medicine hat roster? 17 out of the 25 players on the team were born in January, February, March, or April. The explanation for this is quite simple. It has nothing to do with astrology or anything magical about the first three months of the year. It's simply that in Canada, the eligibility cutoff for age class hockey is January 1st. A boy who turns 10 on January 2nd, then, could be playing alongside someone who doesn't turn 10 until the end of the year. And at that age, in pre-adolescence, a 12-month gap in age represents an enormous difference in physical maturity. This being Canada, the most hockey-crazed country on earth, coaches start to select players for the traveling rep squad, the all-star teams, at the age of 9 or 10. And of course, they are more likely to view as talented the bigger and more coordinated players who have had the benefit of those extra critical months of maturity. And what happens when a player gets chosen for a rep squad? He gets better coaching, and his teammates are better, and he plays 50 or 75 games a season instead of 20 games a season like those left behind in the house league, and he practices twice or even three times more than he would have otherwise. In the beginning, his advantage wasn't so much that he was inherently better, but only that he was a little older. But by the age of 13 or 14, with the benefit of better coaching and all that extra practice under his belt, he really is better. So he's the one more likely to make it to Major Junior A and from there into the big leagues. Barnsley argues that these kind of skewed age distributions exist wherever three things happen. Selection, streaming, and differentiated experience. If you make a decision about who is good and who is not at an early age, if you separate the so-called talented from the so-called untalented, and if you provide the so-called talented with a superior experience, then you're going to end up giving a huge advantage to that small group of people born closest to the cutoff date. In the United States, football and basketball don't have these problems. They don't select and stream and differentiate quite as dramatically. As a result, a child can be a bit behind physically in those sports and still play as much as his or her more mature peers. But baseball does. The cutoff date for almost all non-school baseball leagues in the United States is July 31st, with the result that more major league players are born in August than any other month. The numbers are striking. In 2005, there were 505 Americans born in August playing Major League Baseball versus 313 born in July. 
European soccer, similarly, is organized like hockey and baseball, and the birthday distributions in that sport are heavily skewed as well. In England, the eligibility date is September 1st. And in the Football Association's Premier League at one point in the 1990s, there were 288 players born between September and November, and only 136 players born between June and August. In international soccer, the cutoff date used to be August 1st, and in one recent Junior World Championship tournament, there were 135 players born in the first three months after August 1st, and just 22 born in May, June, and July. Today, the cutoff date for international junior soccer is January 1st. And if you look at the roster of the 2007 Czechoslovakian national junior soccer team, which made the Junior World Cup finals, do you know what you find? Of the team's 21 players, six were born in January, six were born in February, three were born in March, one was born in April, and no one on the team was born after the end of September. At the national team tryouts, the Czech soccer coaches might as well have told everyone born after midsummer to pack their bags and go home. Hockey and soccer are just games, of course.